to one and all. Uh, first of all, welcome to this first final lecture of this session. Today we have here Mr. Uh, Dr. Vikram Mukherjee from Ashoka University, and he's going to talk about different acid circuits. Before we go on with the talk, I would like to introduce DP sir. Well, he is a professor at Ashoka University in Department of Physics. He is bachelor from Saint Stephen's College, 1987, and he is masters. He is masters. Right. He is masters from DU. After which he moved on to his PhD in University of Maryland, USA, in astronomy. Uh, he joined our college and he got in our college from 1996-2021. After which he moved on to Ashoka University. He has enlightened thousands of students, and we are looking forward to this talk, sir. Now, with that, I have to invite Vicky. I guess 
I'm going to answer the question is to ask yourself what is a resistance? So what is a resistance? Tell me, what is a resistance? This matters. with the current. Indians with the current flowing. Indians with the flowing current. Okay, what kind of element is it? What kind of circuit element is it? It's what you normally consider a dissipative circuit element. It's a dissipative circuit element, whereas L and C are not dissipative. They, they don't dissipate any energy, but R dissipates the energy. Would you agree that a dissipative circuit element is a circuit element that, when connected to a power source, can draw power in a sustained manner? Does that make sense? Whereas if you have a non-dissipative element, whatever power you take is returned to the power source. So it's, it's oscillates back and forth. Whereas if you have a dissipative circuit element, it draws power in a sustained manner. Now can you tell me why an infinite chain of L's and C's can have a pure resistance, should be purely resistant? I've given you a hint. Any any power that the circuit draws from the source will be trapped forever inside it. You essentially got it. It's not trapped forever, it goes away to infinity, it never returns. So it's essentially what's called a waveguide. This is a this infinite circuit of L's and C's is like a waveguide that ends at you know at infinity. It just keeps going, things just go into infinity. And they never return. So it makes perfect sense, if you look at it like that, that this should be purely resistive. So let's work out the, I won't do all the steps of the calculation, but suppose you want to figure out this effective resistance. So what this is saying is, if I replaced this infinite chain by an inference, this should have the same impedance as this circuit. But this circuit is infinite. Therefore, if I have a little bit of the circuit, let's say I have one branch, one step of the circuit, or one segment of the circuit, and then I end it with Z, the total impedance of this should be how much? Z once again. And you can terminate it anywhere with the effective impedance of this, and it should have the same impedance. But that allows you immediately to calculate what Z is. Because it, what you have now is Z plus I omega L. This pair, oh, sorry, L by 2. In parallel with C, this, this is in parallel with C. And that block is in series with this. This should be equal to Z. You solve this, and you get Z is equal to You get only one root. L by C minus omega squared. Would anyone like to make any observation about this answer? Do you see anything in this that we should notice? Anything? Do you see two possibilities? What are the two possibilities? L by C is less than omega squared. Yeah, either it's positive, in which case you have purely resistive. All this thing is negative, in which case you have purely imagined. So there's a cutoff. But I will not be considering the case of the cutoff, because it turns out that when you go to the continuous limit, there is no cutoff. Why is that? Suppose you have the continuous limit. What do I mean by the continuous limit? Now, when I draw these inductance coils and capacitances, what you would naturally think about are actual capacitances in the lab and actual coils, because we have that. But this could just as easily be a schematic of something else that has a certain amount of inductance per unit length and a certain amount of capacitance per unit length. It could just be a schematic diagram of that. It could be a discretized version of that. 
So one thing that in the lab that you have of this kind is called a wave barrier. And it's what you use to connect your DSO to your signal generator. So you have some, some cable like this. You see that DSO cable? It does a cross section like this. It's, a, it's called a coaxial cable. And you may have noticed, if you look carefully at the coaxial cable, that there is a resistance written over there. Next time you go to the lab, it says 50 ohms. And then you look at the DSOs, and they also say 50 ohms. So you have to ask yourself, what is this 50 ohms? It turns out that this 50 ohms is precisely this effective impedance of the circuit. So you imagine this could be of infinite length, and you ask yourself, what is that resistance corresponding to the infinite length? And we'll see why that, that resistance is important. So if you have a continuous limit, you can attribute an inductance for unit length. This is, this is the inductance for unit length for delta z. Let's say delta z would naturally be of this length. This length. This is the inductance for unit length z. And the capacitance for unit length. So in the continuous limit, you see that this thing goes to zero. The cutoff goes to zero, but this one survives. <coughs> and another thing that you should have pointed out or noticed is that normally when you think of L's and C's, you think of associating a frequency with it because the resistance and now the resonance frequency of an LC circuit is one over under root LC. But you probably haven't associated a resistance with an LMC, but there is also a natural resistance that goes with an LMC. And that resistance is L by C. Or the, the continuous limit is, is currently L by C. And this is a natural resistance associated with this. So with any system that has Inductance per unit length at curly L, inductance and capacitance per unit length curly C, you have a natural resistance associated with it. And the effective impedance of this coil turns out to be just that. So, for example, if you want to work with this system, and what this curly L is and what this curly C is will depend. So, here it's clear what it is it's just L and just C. And then you have to sort of you imagine that this is a discrete version of the actual system. Here, you can work it out very easily. I'm not going to work it out, but I'll tell you how to work it. So you consider this system. And you ask yourself, suppose there's a certain amount of charge on this. What is the electric field in this region? And you know that the capacitance is half, uh, two the energy stored in the capacitor is half 2 squared by C. It can also be converted into this energy stored in the electric field. So the energy stored in the capacitor is the energy stored in the electric field which is the plates of the capacitor. So you can figure out the electric field here, which will be E is equal to lambda charge per unit length divided by 2 pi epsilon naught r. Figure out this integral. And then Find out the charge in this, then take some unit length L. Okay, set some length L. Find out the charge in that length. And then use this equation to equate this energy to this energy. And you will get the capacitance for some length L. And this is a standard problem that you might have done for your uh, In exactly the same way, you can imagine a current passing through this. And you have half L i squared. This can be mapped onto 1 on the 2 million miles. And that gives you L. So this is this is one of the ways to calculate L and C, which you must have learned if you did enough problems in reference. So you can use that system for any system that you choose. You can find the capacitance per unit length and the impedance per unit length. So for example, for this system, let me just give you the answer for this coaxial system. I worked it out. Uh, it's a standard capacitance per unit length. Log so this is B, and this inner radius is B. And the 
낮출 수가 있는 거예요. 
must be this current minus this current. Okay, so kicked off. PQ T is I0. And Q is related to the capacitance. Q is equal to C V. But C is only C delta Z V, so D V. And I'm going to use partial for a second. Partial character, we can understand the moment why. C V T is equal to minus the I So I have dv dt minus one by c. Is this enough or do I need something more? Is this, is this enough information to describe the wave or do I need something? From your experience of waves, you've seen waves, you've done oscillations, waves, etc. Okay, whether you need something more, do you think we can get something more? Okay, let's look at it from different points of view. You should, the point is, if you see this equation, you should get a bit of an edge saying that this equation cannot be the whole story. Why can't it be the whole story? Tell me one reason why it can't be the whole story. Tell me. Because we need the starting point, we need the starting condition. No, no, something, something that you associate with the wave is not appearing in this equation. What is not appearing in this equation? The velocity. Yeah, it's, if the velocity would maybe appear if. See, we have, we've associated two physical quantities with the system an inductance per unit length and a capacitance per unit length. The inductance per unit length is not yet in the picture, but surely it must have something to do with the propagation of the wave. So where is that equation? That's the question. You could look at it like that. You might also say, well, I expect the second order differential equation, but the first order differential equation is as well. But this is not enough. What you need is an equation that tells you how the partial derivative of V with respect to Z is related to the partial derivative of I with respect to Z. And how are you going to get that? Well, you would consider this bit. Okay. Vz minus Vz plus delta Z. Okay. The difference between the voltages of this has an impedance of L in between. So you can write, you will go through the same thing. Vz is minus Vi. L D I D T. So we're going to get L D I D T minus. So this pair of equations, which are called telegraph equations, because in the old days when they had a telegraph, they could describe the propagation of signals through cables. And of course, in a real telegraph equation, you need to put in the real resistance for your network as well. I assume that the resistance for each one is zero. You put these two together, you put this equation. So let's take the second derivative of this. I have v square v, v2 square, which is minus 1 by c, v by dz. And now in di dt, you put in that. So you get. And you get the same equation for I. And you can see the natural speed of propagation of a wave is. So you can describe the propagation of the electromagnetic wave, or if you wish, the signal. If you want to think in terms of circuits, you just say the signal propagating all this. If you want to think in terms of the cable, it's the electromagnetic wave propagating all this. You would, of course, want to write the description in terms of the E field and the B field, which is quite easy. 
But for the long distance, even in terms of V and I, it's propagating down. Yes, it travels when there is no resistance at the speed of light. And this signal propagates down this. So now we sort of have a better picture of what's happening. We take an infinite cable, we connect it to a power source, a signal starts propagating from through this wave and it goes off into infinity. Because it never returns, it has a finite resistance. Suppose I take this circuit, which has some impedance per minute in Z1, and at some point I connect it to another infinite circuit, which has some impedance per unit in Z2, which is different from Z1. What do I expect? What do you expect? Signal is coming down. Yeah. It's just it's barreling down this. Of course, we talk about the same It encounters a different wave guide with a different impedance per unit. There will be some reflection and some transaction. Why is why does there have to be a reflection? Yeah. Which you've said is right. But why does it can give you a reason why there has to be a reflection? In general. Is there a point at which the things on the two sides are the same, but something else is not the same? Look at the boundary between these two sections. What is the same? The voltage across these two points is the same. But V is equal to IZ on both the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and it can't satisfy both those conditions. But it can satisfy that condition if you have, in addition to an incident signal, a reflective signal. And this incident, reflective and transmitted signal is something that's very familiar from optics. And you can work out the reflection coefficient and the transmission coefficient in exactly the same way. Once again, I'm just going to give you the formula. I'll leave it to you to work it out. It's very nice. It's very simple to work it out. And you'll find that I reflected from I incident Z1. And of course, if Z1 is equal to Z2, there is no reflective wave, it goes right through. And these formulas are the direct correlates of things that you would derive in your electromagnetic theory course in a much more complicated way when you're talking about propagation of electromagnetic waves from one medium to another medium. It's the same thing, but it's in a, it's in a different guise. In fact, if instead of this or what you normally associate with it, which is a medium and electromagnetic wave going through it, even if you talk about a string, there's a wave propagating down the string, a transverse wave propagating down the string. Suppose you connect it to another string whose density is diffuse. Exactly the same thing will happen because, once again, well, normally when you have, see, the, if the two strings are connected to each other, the tension must be the same on both sides. But the density could be different on both sides. If a T by rho is different, the velocity of propagation is different. But more to the point, there must be some quantity like the impedance in an electrical circuit corresponding to propagation of waves down the string. And I leave it to you once again to show that if you look at the string, this quantity T times rho. In fact, you can see that very easily. You have T by rho is the velocity. And here you have 1 over square root of C. But you can write this like this. And then you can ask yourself, what does under root L by C correspond to for this formula, and you get T. And you find this just seems like a bit of mathematical jungle, but you can use some physics, figure out what impedance should mean, physically speaking, for a wave propagating down a string, and work it out carefully. It's done in the Berkeley volume waves. You can work it out. You can check that and you'll see. This T rho is the impedance corresponding to propagation of waves down a string. 
So you can make a direct sort of parallel between waves propagating down the string, electromagnetic waves going through different media, and this propagation of electromagnetic signals through a, uh, uh, to an infinite LC chain or through two infinite LC chains. So all this is very nice. This itself is very, very nice. But you can go a little further and do something more interesting. Yeah, this is the second part is over. Does anybody have any questions? You'll understand this only if you work out the maths yourself. There's no point in my doing all the algebra on what is what's due to the idea. Any questions on the second part? The first part was that there is an impedance associated with an infinite LC chain, and that's a wave guide. The second part is if you have two wave guides connected to each other and they have different effective impedances, then you expect this kind of reflection. Yeah. If we have two of them connected, then what happens is if we say for the source, then eventually some energy is reaching back to the source with yep. the reflection, right? So in that case, would the impedance still be a purely real quantity? Yeah, it's, each of them is real, but what's happening is some of the. I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, for instance, something is dissipated right of that normal. Can. It's going back, but what's, uh, what's happening is the effective impedance of these two is still a purely real quantity because you've got one real quantity after another real quantity. But because of this boundary, there is a. I don't know any way of looking. I, I see what you mean. I don't know. So. I mean, it is boundary to infinite case. No, you can have two semi infinite cases. It's going to infinite in this direction. Then how does it reach back? It just goes back to infinity. But yeah, no, it's it's it doesn't have to be infinity, but I mean, it's very long, effectively, and a bit of time. So, for example, when you consider a reflection of a boundary, it's not like there is nothing but this to eternity on this side and eternity on this side. It's essentially the same. Exactly. Yes. You, you, you imagine a power source which would be uh, something moving, oscillating the string like this. And then you ask yourself, what is the rate at which this force is doing work on the string? And you get this T. Okay, now let's come to the third part of the talk, which is also very interesting. current and voltage, blocked current versus voltage for different frequencies, and you have this famous resonance curve which you've done, which is wonderful, one of the most important things in physics. But now, we have another way of looking at this resistance. A resistance, remember, is a dissipative element, but it is equally something that carries a wave power. So we could remove this resistance and replace it with an infinite system. Germany or Ukraine and brought along a long cable. 
That could also be an infinite circle. So power could be conducted along a waveguide. This force is very far away at infinity. So now what do you have? You have now for this waveguide you have a constraint. This waveguide must have the effective impedance of the resistance it replaces. But this waveguide doesn't have that constraint. It could be any waveguide of any. But for the moment, let us assume that we choose a waveguide that has exactly the same effective impedance as this. So we have identical waveguides in two sides. And it's, instead of being joined like this, essentially we're putting an L and a C in between. And we ask ourselves, what happens is this. When omega is equal to 1 over under root S, what happens in this case? So the power is coming in from infinity. And you change the frequency of the power. You arrive at the wave of steady state once again. Everything is in steady state. And you study the response of this side. So you could study what happens on this side, and this side, wherever you want to study. What happens in resonance? What do we know about resonance? Resonance is omega squared is equal to 1 over s. But more fundamentally, if you look at the impedance of the original circuit, z is equal to r. You notice that this condition is satisfied exactly when this term goes to zero. So the imaginary term goes exactly to zero at the resonance. So the impedance of the circuit becomes purely weak. So what happens to this circuit at the resonance? At the resonant frequency of the original LCR circuit? resonant frequency 
frequency of this circuit without actually being in the circuit, by looking at things that are happening away from the circuit, you're essentially throwing away that thing, looking at, looking at what comes out of the circuit, checking this against this, matching this to this, and figuring out whether there's resonance or So this is something called scattering. We're essentially scattering an electromagnetic wave of this circuit and understanding the phenomenon. Now, we can go one step further. If this is behaving like a resonance, uh, sorry, an effective resistance, and we already have something bringing in power, maybe this can work as, as, as the effective resistance as well. It can do both jobs. So we can just get rid of this. Because now, this will serve as both resistance and conduit for the power. Now, the reflection coefficient has to be 1 because whatever goes in has to come out. How do we figure out its resonance? There's something else that happens in resonance. What else happens in resonance? There is a sudden change in the phase. And if you look at the phase between I and R, there is a change in the phase from positive to negative at this point. And so, if you study the phase of this system, even if you have power coming in from one side, you can figure out what the resonance is. The reason I brought this up is not just for amusement. It's amusing, but also because it turns out to be very, very important. When you study scattering. Now, let's consider a more real life example. Go slab of glass. The refractive index here is different from the refractive index in these two sets. The refractive index has to do with the impedance. The refractive index can be easily translated into impedance. So you have an electromagnetic wave coming in from the reflector. Now goes in. And this process continues infinitely. Now it turns out that for a particular thickness, there is a series of frequencies at which there is no reflection. There's perfect transmission through this slab of glass. And this perfect transmission occurs when the sum of all the reflected rays from here interfere destructively with the sum of all the reflected rays. You can see it's exactly the same thing. Here there's one resonant frequency. Here there's an infinite number of resonant frequencies, but otherwise you're talking about exactly the same thing. And in quantum mechanics, if you have a potential well, you're doing quantum, you're doing quantum mechanics? If you're doing a square potential well. You have a particle coming in from this side. A particle coming in from this side can be represented by a wave. There is a, there's a sudden change in the refractive index here, which is like a sudden change in the impedance. There's a reflection from this part. There's a sudden change in the refractive index here. There's a reflection from this part and some transmission. As you change the frequency, which is the energy of this particle, you'll find that for certain well-defined frequencies, certain well-defined energies, there is perfect transmission through this pair of bonds. And you find that those frequencies are precisely the resonant frequencies if you have two boundaries over here. But if you have two boundaries over here and your waves are between, what do you have? You just have a string that is bounded two ends. So you can figure out the resonant frequencies of this without doing anything other than knowing the string. You just know what the, how the string is. You can figure out all the resonant frequencies. It turns out to be the resonant frequencies of an infinite well. The energy levels of infinite. There's one more thing about resonance that you often miss out, which is that at resonance, the power drawn from the, from the uh, source is maximum, but the power dissipated is also maximum, because these two exactly have to match each other. Time average of power is drawn has to be exactly equal to the power, time average of power dissipated. 
But the third thing that is often not noticed is that the power stored in the circuit is a maximum at resonance. So if you look at this system over here, this lab of glass over here, or this quantum mechanical problem, when you have a wave coming in, there's a maximum buildup of the wave at those resonant frequencies. And those states, in other situations, for example, you could create two boundaries by doing something like this, are sort of metastable states of the system. So, this is a very, very nice way of approaching lots of different things in physics. Where you, instead of going inside the system, you sort of probe it from the outside by sending in waves. So, I just wanted to introduce you to the idea of this by using something that you're very, very familiar with and something that you know even the first year students can understand. Thank you. Interesting effect which fascinated me 
was that if you have a real resistance, the capacitance increases. Can anyone tell me why? If the waveguide, if the surfaces of the waveguide have a real resistance, then third year students should be. If you're doing electromagnetic theory now, otherwise it's a little. Okay, what happens is, when you have perfectly conducting metal, the electromagnetic wave doesn't penetrate into the metal at all. But when it has a finite resistance, it has a finite depth of penetration. So the effective region increases in size. One could also think of it in terms of charge accumulation at the boundary. Yeah, yeah. 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 There's charge accumulation at the boundary. So that's what would eventually lead to the yeah. capacity. Yeah, but here, so yeah, that's true. It's charge, but what's happening is when you have a finite resistance, with the, the charge is spread out over a delta, delta T, whereas here it's just U. Yeah. So the capacitance per unit length will increase. So if you ever come across this horrible book, famous and infamous book by Jackson, you see the calculation. all kinds of interesting phenomena. This phenomenon of res resonance is a fundamental phenomenon that occurs in all areas of physics. So when you have this detection of particles and things like that in CERN, essentially they're studying resonances. One of the famous Higgs boson detection is a detection of a resonance. It's a detection of a metastable state. So these things are called metastable states because suppose you it's easier to visualize the resonance if you have two boundaries. So sometimes one of the problems that you can solve if you have quantum mechanics is you have two direct delta wells, sorry, the spikes. When you let something go through, <coughs> work out, it's a, it's a lot of algebra, you work out what happens when the wave goes through two of these direct delta spikes. And at the resonances you find that there is a huge increase in the probability. If you imagine putting the particle in and then watching what happens, what's happening is that it slowly leaks out. So it's effectively there much longer than it would have. And this is a phenomenon of radioactivity. So you could actually try it in your computation lab. Yeah. What you can do is instead of Virag data functions, you could just put two finite barriers. And you have an initial wave packet, and then for just the right momentum, you will see it get stuck inside temporarily. And then when it gets it's stuck and then it slowly decays back to two wave functions. So you can do that in your computation, uh, in your QM computation. Yeah. In some sense, getting stuck is when the state inside matches the energy eigenstate of the... One of the resonance states, yeah. It's not a true eigenstate. Okay. True eigenstates have negative energy. These are sort of, these are false eigenstates in some sense. They're almost like eigenstates, they're called metastable states. So it's decays very slowly. So coming to why I consider the one-sided system. In reality, when you're throwing waves, you throw waves and then they come back. So one the one-dimensional coordinate in this way is when you have a wall on this side, and you have a wave coming. And it scatters off this boundary and reflects off this. Once again, you have the phenomenon of resonance. And you find that the resonant frequencies are two kinds, those corresponding to the actual bound states and those corresponding to the metastable states. And there's a way of distinguishing between them. So, uh, both the devices, like the air counterpart and the quantum mechanical counterpart, they can control the transfer matrix. Yeah, yeah. You use transfer matrices in which you can But even, I mean, even if you just know how to solve the Schrodinger equation, you can do it. It's not that. It's not that tough.